Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar titled Toward a Thriving Post-Pandemic Future, COVID-19's Effect on Corporate Board Governance and Increased Focus on ESG. I'm Suzanne Basala. I'm the President and CEO of the U.S.-Japan Council. At USJC, which was founded by Japanese Americans, our mission is to develop and connect leaders to create a stronger U.S.-Japan relationship. We have a successful history in setting and acting on a forward-looking agenda even when, or especially when, faced with a crisis. Today's discussion is part of that. Today's webinar is only possible thanks to the generous support of our 2020 US Japan Council year round sponsors. And I would like to take a moment to recognize them, especially our platinum sponsor, Fabit, as well as our title sponsors, Central Pacific Bank, Hitachi, Ito N, MUFG, Terasaki Nive Foundation, and the Toyota Research Institute. Now, our speakers are best positioned to frame today's discussion. So I'd like to instead take just a moment to talk about the role of council leaders and other members in helping USJC achieve our mission. USJC is a platform that allows individual members to shine a light on important issues in the US-Japan relationship, convene individuals from both countries, and coordinate actions to bring better outcomes. And today is a great example of doing that. Um, last year, USJC previewed a, a pilot program across the country with four different uh, programs uh, looking at how to provide professional and leadership development for mid and senior level executives. And ACO organized the first of those, ACO Williams, who will be moderating today, organized the first of those in Los Angeles. Uh, and she put together a seminar on how to get on boards. At the time, I was a volunteer for USJC, and I participated in the Silicon Valley platform. And to me, that was the essence of the membership experience in US Japan Council, being able to work with other people to create a platform on issues that were important to us, having a chance to work together and support each other and learn from each other, and to make friends in the process. And so today, um, it's really my honor to introduce Akko as our moderator. Akko Williams served as Vice President Council General and Corporate Secretary of Ushio America Incorporated. That's where she currently is, is working. As a native of Japan, Ms. Williams uses her language skills and deep understanding of both Japanese and US business cultures in providing effective legal and strategic advice to Ushio America and other group companies. She's also a corporate board director and serves on, his, on the advisory board of design thinking at UC Riverside. Luckily for us, she chairs the USJC Southern California and Southwest region, and she's also a mother of two active daughters. So Akko, thank you for um, moderating and organizing today's panel, and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, good afternoon to those of you in the US, and good morning, ohayou gozaimasu to uh, those of you in Japan. Uh, my name is Akko Williams, um, as uh, Susan, uh, Suzanne introduced me. I'm currently um, the uh, Southern California uh, Southwest Regional Chair of the US Japan Council, and also um, I'm Vice President and General Counsel for Ushio America, which is a US subsidiary of Ushio Denki in Japan. Um, today, I'm really excited to um, moderate this discussion on COVID 19's effect on corporate board governance and the increased uh, focus on ESG. Uh, just let me spend a couple of minutes to introduce my esteemed panel uh, panelists today uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, first, Dr. Bonnie Hill. Uh, Bonnie is co-founder of Icon Blue, a brand marketing company based in Los Angeles. She has over 26 years of experience serving on 12 corporate boards and a wide range of career in business, government, education, and philanthropy. Uh, Bonnie currently serves on the board of the Bank of California and the Rand Corporation. She has previously served on the boards of uh, the California Water Service, Young Brands, the Home Depot, and AK Steel Holding Corporation, to name a few. She has received numerous awards uh, for her years of board service and involvement in philanthropic activities. Bonnie holds a doctorate from UC Berkeley. And then uh, Marcus Otsuji. Marcus is the Japan country manager of Geodesic Capital, which is a venture capital 
co-founded by former U.S. Ambassador to Japan, John Ruth. Geodesic focuses on growth stage software companies, and Marcus leads Geodesic Japan's operations in Tokyo, where he and his team support portfolio companies with their Japan entry and Japan growth strategies. Before Geodesic, Marcus was a partner at a boutique consulting firm, Japan Works, Japan country manager at web analytics startup Omniture, and had a number of sales and business development positions at Apple Japan. Marcus holds an MBA from the University of Hawaii. And then uh, Commissioner Genevieve Shiroma. Genevieve was appointed to the California Public Utilities Commission by California Governor Gavin Newsom in January 2019. Prior to CPUC, Genevieve served as a member of the Agri um, Agricultural Labor Relations Board for 20 years, serving as chair since 2017. Before that, she served as the chief of the air quality branch at the California Air Resources Board for nine years and as an air quality engineer 12 years before that. Genevieve holds a Bachelor of Science in uh, Material Science and Engineering from the UC Davis. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, next slide, please. So it'll be the first slide. What is ESG? Are you seeing that? The next one. Yes. So uh, base, this is ESG 101. Uh, the, uh, the term ESG was first widely publicized uh, back in 2006 uh, by then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan when he proposed the uh, principles for responsible inve investment, PRI. And the PRI insisted that um, investors must consider ESG in making investment decisions. So what are ESG? So E is environment, environmental, S is social, and uh, G is uh, governance. So it's the consideration of environmental, social, and governance factors alongside financial factors in the uh, investment decision-making process. There is no like, definite uh, consensus of what each pillar uh, consists of. So these are some of the examples. Um, environmental issues include carbon emissions, water and waste management, deforestation, air and water pollution, energy efficiency, uh, social issues that are uh, more prominent right now because of causes, um, labor practices, human rights, um, you know, worker health and safety, uh, community involvement, diversity, um, data protection and privacy could be part of the social issues and customer satisfaction. And lastly, the government issues would include uh, board diversity, uh, management diversity, compensation issues, risk management, uh, shareholder engagement, and so on and so forth. Um, the uh, the environmental and social factors tend to be more stakeholder focused, whereas governance is more about what's best for the company's optimal operation for its shareholders. And uh, growing data show that the pandemic has actually intensified investors' focus on ESG practices as it has disrupted global supply chains and affected companies' human capital management practices. And environmental and uh, if you could move to the next slide. Yes. So you can see, um, this is some information from um, um, early 2020. The total environmental and social proposals continue to outnumber uh, governance proposals. Uh, the number of shareholder proposal filings by proposal category here and as you can see, the, the gray and yellow categories, so the social and the environmental ones, they, they are more of those than governance issues. So um, the, uh, you can see lobbying, political activities, human capital management, uh, human rights issues uh, in the social pillar, environmental uh, climate change that constitute the, the most proposals and other environmental uh, proposals, probably lobbying, uh, disclosure issues, and sustainability, and shareholder rights, and uh, board-related, probably uh, related to diversity of a board composition. Uh, those had you know, high numbers. 
Excuse me. And then um, the recent research shows that long-term ESG strategies remain the, at the top of mind for institutional investors during the current crisis. They don't want us to lose sight of long-term ESG strategies. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the recent leading studies have shown a strong relationship between ESG rating and stock price performance in situations where corporate um, trust is questioned, for example, during a financial crisis. And this slide shows um, the, uh, the comparison of stock price changes in the first quarter of 2020 in Japan among top 100 Japanese listed companies. The, the tier one group, which is at the bottom, uh, that had the highest corporate social responsibility or CSR ranking, and the top bar uh, that represents the uh, tier four group, that had the lowest CSR ranking. The CSR ranking reflects employment, environment, social, and uh, governance factors. And uh, the sample comprised the top 100 listed Japanese firms with the uh, high market capitalization. So as you can see, the uh, companies that had the, the highest CSR rankings uh, had the, uh, the least effect of, um, you know, as in Japan, as you know, the, the COVID actually hit earlier than in the US, um, the uh, Diamond Princess, uh, ship cruise ship arrived in Japan in early February, and the first case was detected in January. So, although uh, their lockdown measures have been fairly lenient, uh, the effect actually was felt earlier than in the U.S. And um, the uh, high CSR ranking uh, rating companies tended to be least affected compared with the uh, the the companies that had lower. CSR rankings, according to this study. So um, here are uh, here's a question for Bernie and Marcus. Actually, um, based on your experience, do you think that ESG initiatives support resilience against market fluctuations and other unexpected events? So uh, maybe Bernie, you can get started. Um, you know, it really depends on the initiative and on the company. Uh, there is no one size fits all. We'd like to think that there is uh, and that we could just say it's best for everyone to do this. But you have to take a careful look at the particular initiative and how it works within the company. And then it has to be evaluated by management and the board before an actual decision is made. Okay. How about you, Marcos? Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. So correlation definitely has uh, been proven, but not causation just yet. Um, <clears throat> I'll just maybe throw out a couple of examples of, of uh, um, cases where it's worked. Um, one of them was my former employer, uh, Apple. Um, if you guys saw their earnings announcement last week, they had complete blowout earnings, right? And this was in a, uh, so I'm putting on my, my uh, investor hat to, uh, for this question and not my Japan hat. But um, uh, this was in a quarter when expectations were super low, right? Um, in fact, Goldman Sachs even downgraded the stock during the quarter, but then they ended up having the best Q3 ever. And um, I think, so the question is why? And I think it's not an exaggeration to say that it was in fact in large part due to their investments in ESG, like the right ESG. Um, activities, um, and in particular with regards to COVID, uh, their investments in their de dedication to data privacy, right? Um, we're all kind of uh, familiar with, you know, Touch ID and Face ID, uh, which on the product side brought, you know, huge, uh, um, you know, convenience in addition to security. Um, but it's not only the product side, right? Apple um, is in a pretty public um, uh, dispute with the, directly with the Department of Justice right now. Um, and they famously refused uh, the Department of Justice's demand to create a backdoor you know, to the iPhone, right? And they've even been willing to go to court. That hasn't happened yet, but they've shown that they're willing to go to court to fight the Department of Justice you know, to protect customer data. Um, and uh, I think, so during COVID, right, as companies shut down, as people started to work from home, um, 
you know, naturally individuals and companies migrated or I think, uh, you know, bought products that they thought were going to protect their data. And that's why um, overwhelmingly uh, companies and individuals, you know, uh, you know went to Apple. Um, another quick example is one of our portfolio companies, Uber. Um, Uber, and this is all public information. This is not anything that's confidential. So Uber's business was uh, decimated, right? Their core ride business was decimated by COVID. Um, nobody's traveling, no one's going outside, um, no one's taking Uber rides. Um, but they happened to have this kind of side um, emerging business called Uber Eats, which was food delivery, right? Um, and this business started to explode, right, in a good way. Um, huge demand as people were, you know, hunkered down in their homes. Um, and Uber Eats was able to connect restaurants and keep them in business, right? Um, and on the consumer side, right, at least help consumers maintain some semblance of normalcy um, being able to, you know, eat at their favorite restaurants, even though they had to do it at home. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about Uber, though, is that as they're making this huge social contribution on the one side, um, there's this huge controversy on the other side about um, how to define, uh, you know, gig economy workers, right? Are they employees or are they, um, you know, independent contractors? And so, you know, these are kind of really fluid, new kind of emerging issues, right, where uh, contribution on one side may, um, um, you know, expose, you know, risks, you know, in another area. And so um, there's no, I don't think, easy answer, but, you know, whatever the resolution to this particular problem is, it's going to have a huge, you know, impact on, on companies, on workers, you know, on, you know, social safety nets and things like that. And so um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But I think to answer your question, Ako, most definitely um, uh, ESG absolutely can, the right ESG, to, to Bonnie's uh, point, um, you know, the right uh, projects for the right companies can definitely, um, you know, contribute in a large way to resilience. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So that, like, clearly there are so many things that directors now think need to think about uh, for the health of the company and all these uh, different issues. Um, you know, probably at the top of everybody's mind is the balance sheet strong enough. Um, and then uh, of course, you, know, you have to have, uh, you know, to ensure worker safety. Is the company doing enough to ensure employee health and safety? What can the company do to, do to maintain productivity through the working from home environment? Supply chain issues, uh, business model. Um, are customer preferences changing? Definitely. Is the business model too cyclical? Um, is the old strategy still work? Um, how do we adapt to the new normal and thrive? And new cybersecurity threats. Um, you, know, you probably have heard that Canon USA, I've heard about it, was hit by a ransomware attack a few days ago, um, you know, even my company has experienced a huge surge in cyber attacks. Of course, my IT department is excellent, so, you know, they're protecting us, but uh, certainly cyber risk has increased dramatically since everybody started working from home. And then also heightened awareness of socioeconomic status, uh, socioeconomic issues, including a focus on racial equality after that, um, you know, tragic George Floyd incident in May. And is the company perceived as a good corporate citizen? Are we doing enough as a responsible member of the so society at large? So we have all these issues. And um, a, qu a question for all of you is, um, what are the hot button issues each of you are currently seeing, um, issues that are most pressing for the board? So uh, we can start <laughs> through Bonnie and uh, Marcus and Genevieve. How would you like to proceed with this, Akko? Uh, you want to call on each of us, or? Genevieve hasn't said anything yet, so. Morning, can you start? Oh, sure, I can. Um, I think some of the hot button issues are um, that, first of all, that we see all people as equal. We have to start there, Akko, related to your, your discussion around the George Floyd issue. If we begin to see all people as equal, then we will think about the other social issues that are very important. Families are, you know, our employees who are working at home, many of them have children, uh, many of them have elderly parents, they have situations that they have to deal with. 
that uh, has made it very difficult for them to return to the workplace. Uh, we have to make certain that we're providing the proper workplace for them when they do return and giving them the support that's necessary while they're working remotely. Uh, certainly in the banking industry, it's very uh, difficult sometimes to think about how you deal with customers who want to come to your branches. And uh, while we can use technology and technology is great, one of the things we have to focus on is the elderly people who really don't use technology a lot. That becomes a big social issue. Uh, another issue for our employees that are working from home is also their mental health. So aside from their health in terms of keeping them safe, it is how are they handling with all of these issues mentally. And, um, you know, so those are some of the social issues that I will tee up and pass it on to my colleagues for more. Genevieve? Yes, thank you, Alko, everyone. I, thank you so much for including me in this very important discussion today. You know, for the California Public Utilities Commission, it, it is all about seamless delivery of essential services. You know, the CPUC regulates uh, energy, both gas and electricity, water, telecommunications, uh, and transportation. And the hot button issue for us during this pandemic, and even before, uh, is that uh, customers receive these services, that they are affordable, that the companies themselves are financially stable, uh, that we are providing for uh, essential worker safety. You know, energy workers, utility workers are essential workers. Uh, we also <clears throat> have been looking to provide for temporary customer relief uh, because of the stay-at-home environment. Uh, people are using more electricity uh, and in and around all that too to assure that our low income and vulnerable uh, customers are, uh, are being provided relief, uh, that there are options uh, for uh, help with bills. And, and as we are doing all that, to continue to do the work of the commission you know, we, we have numerous proceedings underway uh, having to do with rates, having to do with microgrids, having to do with uh, innovations in renewable energy. Uh, we have very aggressive climate change goals that we need to uh, meet. Uh, and uh, in around that, we are looking at new opportunities for where have we uh, not been able to uh, achieve efficiencies. And speaking of efficiencies, that means energy efficiency. Uh, we are investing a lot in uh, providing for uh, uh, energy efficiencies for customers, for homeowners. There is a whole segment of uh, customers who are renters. And how do we provide for uh, a, a, an investment in uh, a, for renters a situation when their property is owned uh, by a landlord. Uh, and in around all that too, uh, how do we provide for uh, diversity of our workforce, for diversity uh, uh, externally uh, in terms of the business uh, climate? Uh, we are a very big influencer in what happens in uh, California business. And I'll look forward to touching more on each of those items as we have this conversation today. Thank you. Okay, Marcus. Sure. So I think um, I'll take off my investor hat, put on my Japan hat for this one. Um, it's pretty clear almost across the board for Japan boards right now, it's two issues. Um, one is work from home and the other one is digital transformation. Um, so work from home is huge. I think it's a once in a lifetime, once in a generation opportunity for Japanese companies to finally in a meaningful way um, address work-life balance. Um, in Japanese, hataraki-kata kaikaku, which has been a huge issue for the society for years. And they've never really been able to meaningfully um, address this. Uh, just a lot of um, really kind of ham-fisted um, uh, policies that were ineffectual. Um, but because of COVID, all of a sudden, uh, at, all at once, everyone has the opportunity to work from home. And, uh, you know, uh, Everyone loves it almost universally. 
uh, which is fantastic. And companies have had the opportunity to also um, uh, prove essentially that uh, workers can be extremely uh, efficient with their work at the same time. And so um, I'm not sure what's going to happen, um, but I really, I hope, I, I deeply hope and pray that, um, you know, they're going to find the right balance between going to the office um, and allowing workers, you know, to stay home and have, you know, just better, you know, work-life balance. On the digital transformation side, um, Japanese companies have been, um, you know, talking about digital transformation and dabbling uh, for years as well. But because of COVID, uh, everything is moving online, you know, customer transactions, customer communications, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it's been accelerated, right, to, you know, the forefront of, you know, things that are not only urgent and important, but existential. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of accelerated timelines around uh, not only upgrading infrastructure, which is one side of the coin, but also uh, developing and launching new digital products and services for customers. So I think those are definitely yeah, the two things that all Japanese companies are thinking about right now. Okay, thank you. So let's um, spend a few minutes uh, discussing uh, the social issues. So right now, clearly, we are seeing uh, focusing more on the health and safety and the productivity of our employees. But until now, social factors were considered to have a relatively small effect on stock prices um, in the past um, and corporate value compared to environmental and government, governance related factors. But this, is, this view is changing. Um, as we've uh, touched on, social issues include human capital management, diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, worker health and safety, and human rights issues. Um, in a recent webcast that I um, hosted by KPMG that I attended, of the 470 directors and C-level executives, 27% said that they expect a more significant discussion on workplace diversity and pay equity in upcoming disclosures and proxy statements because of COVID-19. We have seen reports and research showing um, also, this is, um, this, is, this is not good. Women and minorities are more severely affected by the current pandemic because hourly jobs and um, industries that have been more severely affected like restaurants, retail, uh, tourism, uh, customer service, they tend to have more women and minority workers. So uh, the, ne the next question I have um, for all of you is what can we do to minimize the uh, disparate effects of future crisis that we undoubtedly will have um, on women, minorities, and lower socioeconomic status communities. Uh, maybe uh, Genevieve could start. Sure, yes. Uh, so I'll approach this really from looking externally and then also looking internally. Again, the CPUC regulates uh, investor-owned utilities, electricity, gas, water, communications, uh, transportation, including the transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft. And in, externally, uh, perhaps because we've been experiencing catastrophic wildfires uh, in California, we've been working for some time now to address uh, uh, these issues. And now we have the pandemic layered uh, on uh, an already vulnerable situation in, in California. I think we've taken in a view that if, if we do look out for our vulnerable communities, uh, our access and functional needs communities, uh, then that will lift all boats. Uh, we have actually adopted an access and functional needs definition, which includes physical, developmental, or intellectual disabilities, uh, chronic conditions or injuries, uh, limited English proficiency, uh, elderly, children, low-income, homeless, and transportation disadvantaged. And of course, women uh, are uh, the glue throughout all of this. Uh, we uh, have um, looked to define what, what are the minimum essential services for clean drinking water, for communications, uh, for transportation, uh, and we have looked to, to coordinate that closely with our California Office of Environment, uh, of Emergency Services. If need be, it's also CAL FIRE, our local governments and, and nonprofits that, 
the uh, CBOs are very important and also our tribal governments. We have over 120 uh, separate and distinct tribal governments in California. Uh, again, if we are looking out for our most vulnerable populations, all boats will be lifted. Uh, in around the, the business aspect of this, uh, in order to have uh, the seamless service I mentioned before, uh, the investor-owned utilities need to be in sound financial condition. And, and that does mean keeping an eye to Wall Street uh, and an eye to how the investors are viewing these uh, regulated entities. Uh, in around that, we also require through state law that the, uh, the investor-owned utilities invest uh, in diverse suppliers. It is something we refer to as GEO 156. And this can affect women in business. Uh, it requires that there be investment in women-owned, minority-owned, LGBTQ-owned, and disabled veterans-owned uh, businesses. Uh, and there are, it's, this has been ongoing for over 30 years. Uh, the um, supplier diversity has grown from $435,000 in 1987 to more than $12 billion today. And that work must continue. Uh, uh, so uh, meanwhile, internally, we are <clears throat> participating. We have 1,300 employees. Uh, and we uh, absolutely embraced five commissioners, the executive team absolutely embraced that there is much more to do in terms of the diversity of our workforce, gender, uh, ethnic. Uh, we are participating in something called the California Strategic Growth Council's Capital Collaborative on the Race and Equity. It's called CORE. It's a community of California state government entities working together uh, since 2018 to learn about, plan for, and implement activities that embed racial equity approaches into our institutional cultures, policies, and practices. Also, in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, we have formed at the CPUC a diversity, equity, inclusion working group. Uh, this is a recent activity. It is comprised of diverse staff, about 15 so far, and they will advise us on organizational changes aimed to achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion as a cultural and institutional imperative at the commission. We believe through all these eff efforts, external and internally, uh, we have a much better chance at uh, assuring that we have left no one behind in terms of uh, women, uh, our vulnerable communities, our, our ethnic communities, uh, and so forth. So thank you. I'll go, thank you, back to you. Okay. Boni? Well, uh, I think that within every organization, you know, there is work to be done in terms of, of raising the level of women and minorities. But if we go to your question about the areas in which women and minorities tend to be uh, in, in, you know, have more des desperate uh, effect, I think we have to think about um, education, uh, whether or not we're providing training and education to individuals who are in those areas, and that also any support that goes out to businesses finds its way also to minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. Uh, we really had no way of tracking that to see if they are getting the same kind of support that more major businesses have gotten. So we need to take a look at the aid. And you're asking, uh, what do we do for the future to make certain that um, the crisis is not, doesn't um, really affect minorities and women and uh, disadvantaged communities more disproportionately. And I think that it, that means there's a lot of work for all of us. And that work includes, do we give them the right access? Do we promote women and, and minorities in our companies uh, that we're involved in to help them raise their families? Are we providing the right educational access uh, for them and for their children? What about daycare? Because these women most often uh, not only care for the elderly uh, in their families, but also for the children. And I think about, you know, even um, in my own family, you know, the one daughter that has a child that doesn't get a chance to go back to school and she's had to become teacher. And how do you support, you know, mm -hmm. women particularly who have now become the teachers 
Uh, it lets us know how desperately the teachers are needed. What kind of support can we give them? How are those children being taught so that we don't raise up another whole generation of individuals who will not find them way, their way out of being disadvantaged? So I think we have a lot of work to do, particularly in education, training, and in the companies that provide uh, the services to uh, the restaurants and um, other, you know, uh, services that use women in minority in, in more disproportionate uh, ways. A lot of work to do there, Akko. Yep, I agree. So, Marcus, are you seeing a similar situation in Japan, uh, more like women, uh, certain groups being more affected than others? And is there anything that can be done about it? Um, yeah, most definitely. So uh, one of the biggest pushes of, you know, Prime Minister Abe um, has been to get more women in the workforce. Um, you know, traditionally, uh, it's interesting because Japan has had sort of the opposite focus as the U.S. Um, the U.S. has focused primarily on shareholders and not as much on stakeholders. Um, Japan traditionally has largely ignored shareholders and focused on stakeholders. Um, it's just that most of those stakeholders were men. Right. Um, so they're the ones who benefited from things like lifetime employment, socialized medicine and things like that. And there's a huge push right now, um, you know, legislatively um, and, uh, you know, also culturally um, to do the hard, you know, do the work finally to make, uh, you know, the workplace um, um, a place that's more friendly uh, to women. Part of it is legislative. Right. There was the governance code that was passed in 2015 and stewardship code in 2014. Um, I'm not sure if it's so much legislation as guidelines, but, you know, in generally, in general, they're being followed. And a lot of that is about, you know, workers' rights for, uh, for women. Um, <clears throat> there's also existential pressure, right, from society, just because Japan has this declining population problem. Um, they also still have an unemployment rate, which is under 3%. And so they just don't have enough workers. And that's pushing more women uh, into the workplace as well, or I should say pulling more women into the workplace as well. Um, but most importantly, I think, is uh, um, social acceptance, right? Even in the last 18 years since I've been here, um, there's been a huge shift, you know, in just the acceptance of, you know, women remaining in the workforce uh, after they get married, after they have kids. Um, and um, I think that more than anything is, is uh, you know, going to drive, um, you know, better conditions for women in the workforce going forward. There's still a lot of structural impediments, you know, for women to work forward. It's, it's interesting to hear Bonnie talk about, you know, lack of um, childcare. And that's one of the biggest problems in Japan, right? It's just that there's a huge lack of childcare and they've been building new facilities like crazy, but they don't have the people to staff them. So they've been trying to recruit them from overseas. Um, but in either case, all of those things, legislation, uh, you know, social pressures are in motion. Like all things in Japan, it's going to take time, but it's definitely a huge focus right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, let's move on to the environmental issues a little bit. Um, the highest number of environment-related proposals um, had to do with climate change during this proxy season. Uh, for example, demanding disclosures on carbon footprint, lobbying, and political contributions. They focused on alignment with the Paris Agreement. And we all know that as a result of the economic shutdown, we have cleaner air and water at the beach. That's the result of uh, fewer greenhouse emissions, uh, greenhouse gases. The International Energy Agency estimates that this year's emission will be down around 8% from last year. So that's from 51 billion tons, actually, to 47 billion tons. So it would be great if we could continue this rate of decrease every year, but we obviously can't. Uh, we've lost you know, 730,000 people's lives uh, as of last week and tens of millions of people out of work. So we can't continue this lockdown, obviously. Um, economists use um, $100 per ton of carbon reduction as a reasonable price for the cost of a carbon reduction strategy. COVID uh, reduced 8% of emission compared with last year, but it was achieved at a cost of about $3,200 to $5,400 per ton in the U.S. and the EU. So it's clearly not a good carbon reduction strategy. 
So if we didn't do a better job in tackling climate change, we'll see the same kind of devastating impact on human lives and economy. We'll continue to have more wildfires, severe hurricanes, um, raised sea level, extreme heat, and so on and so, so forth. They will result in more death, lost productivity, rising energy costs, severe financial risks to corporations, um, agricultural issues, damage to infrastructure, and this you know, goes on and on. So um, this question is for Genevieve. Um, I think you've touched on this um, a little bit, but what does CPUC do to address climate change? Is it investing in resiliency managers? And the next question is, what is CPUC doing to help lessen the hardship people are going through and deal with the change in the energy usage patterns these days? Uh, yes, the, these are great questions. As soon as the pandemic hit, as soon as the stay-at-home orders were in place, uh, we made it clear to all, uh, to the people of California, to the investor-owned utilities, uh, gas, electricity, we need to adjust quickly, we need to be nimble, and we need to keep making progress to the zero greenhouse gas goals. SB, Senate Bill 100 requires California to be at a zero greenhouse gas footprint by 2045. And so not only for the California Public Utilities Commission and, and the utilities that we regulate, but also the California Air Resources Board and others have continued to make progress in terms of adopting regulations. Now, and, I'll, and this speaks to the second question about the hardship people are experiencing. We, we are doing this along with emergency measures uh, for, uh, uh, for, for providing assistance. Now, I'll, I'll go into that in a moment. Uh, not only do we have SB 100, we also have, have uh, Senate Bill 350, which requires vast investment in renewable energy. Uh, and so <clears throat> through uh, quite a few years of uh, adopting rates for the utilities. These requirements are, are being folded into the, the um, fi financing, the budgeting, the, um, the metrics to be achieved. In terms of those investments, uh, there are milestones between now and 2045. We, have, we are saying we are going to do it. We are going to keep on pace. Uh, people are staying at home. They're uh, they're using more electricity, they're using more uh, energy. Uh, we have a, a campaign to urge energy efficiency, to pay attention to those, uh, those expensive times of the day uh, and throughout the, these various seasons. We have um, a um, program uh, that provides for refunds uh, based on carbon and we have spread those through the summer season in order to help defray bills. And not only for low income, but, but for all. Resiliency is a, is a very essential piece of this um, journey. Uh, I'm the lead commissioner on what we call a microgrid proceeding. Uh, and as we are heading into far, fire season this fall, we did uh, some very expedited uh, decisions to provide for the utilities to uh, uh, have microgrids in place at th their key substations and some of their key areas that tend to experience uh, wildfires because what they are doing is they are doing public safety power shutoffs in advance. It they, they was massive last year in 2019. Uh, it was very, very disruptive for folks. Uh, this year we want to have far less of that. We've required all kinds of things in terms of uh, investments into the system all those investments which occurred prior to the pandemic and even during the pandemic, uh, I have provided for uh, jobs, for uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the infrastructure investments. Uh, we know that, that it, it, the reason why uh, we are very important in the fifth largest economy in the world it is through all of these investments. Uh, now, in around all that, uh, there, there certainly would be, you know, a tendency to say, well, we sh should we postpone some of these requirements? And we have, we have said no. Uh, and, uh, and through the months from March till now, we have adopted any, any number of things. We have had <clears throat> uh, programs in place for discounts on uh, energy bills since uh, 1980, in, since the 1980s. Also for communications. 
The other thing about the stay at home, and Bonnie alluded to it, and so did Marcus, uh, the, the, the schools have been doing a remote teaching, uh, and that has required the need for internet uh, and broadband for connectivity. Uh, and in California, we have gaps. Uh, and so we have been working on uh, filling those gaps in terms of uh, uh, just the, the internet accessibility, plus also the tools for students, the tablets, uh, and to, to be able to actually connect with their teachers. Uh, we have a weatherization program for, uh, that's, that's free for low-income customers that the utilities have been implementing for, uh, for a very long time. So, and for those households that were able to uh, acquire or, or, or have these uh, weatherization um, retrofits, we hope that it helps defray the energy costs uh, for this summer. Uh, also, <clears throat> we are looking at the next generation of all of these programs. Uh, and we recently adopted a major multi-million dollar program uh, for uh, the, uh, the uh, bat battery storage. And they're again focusing on vulnerable communities, medical rate communities, folks who need oxygen, who need um, electricity in order to survive. Uh, and we are focusing on those communities uh, for uh, low cost or zero cost uh, backup battery storage. I'll stop there and uh, let others <clears throat> weigh in. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Marcus, uh, we understand that ESG engagement is gain gaining momentum in Japan. There was a first ever um, environmental related proposal against the Mizuho uh, Financial Group this season, and um, it actually received 34% of uh, the affirmative votes. So do you think COVID act will act as a catalyst um, for more environmental initiatives in Japan? And actually, there are a couple of questions for you that I received from the audience, but I'll let you answer my first oh, question. Really? Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I think uh, in general, like out of E, S, and G, um, Japan has been mostly focused on S and G and not E. Um, so, uh, you know, it's interesting that, you know, this actually was, as you mentioned, the first ever um, proposal against uh, a public Japanese corporation. Um, with regards to the environment. Um, as you mentioned, it was soundly defeated. Uh, however, um, I think um, corporations are on notice, right? And this is gonna be uh, definitely a continuing trend. Um, I think Japanese corporations are very aware that if they wanna be recognized as a responsible social uh, citizen, you know, um, or corporate citizen, that they need to, you know, get on board with a lot of these trends. Um, with the Mizuho, uh, proposal. I think directionally, Mizuho was already moving in that direction, and specifically, right, they were the um, the proposal was to divest uh, coal-based investments, and I think that was already on the roadmap for them. It was just the timelines that they weren't in agreement with. Uh, the proposal was for it to happen much faster than they were uh, comfortable with. Um, but again, directionally, uh, the proposal wasn't wrong. And I think in general, Japanese corporations are moving in that direction. Um, I think one of the things they need to do though is to have more productive conversations with NPOs, right? Traditionally, NPOs haven't had a lot of uh, power in Japan. Um, and so they've largely been ignored by the corporations. Um, this particular proposal was brought by Nikko Networks of Kyoto, an NPO based out of Kyoto. And, um, you know, those types of conversations I think need to be had at the board level um, so that they know, understand what's happening in Japan and, and globally and they can make better decisions with regards to, uh, um, to the environment. Okay, so one of the questions for you that I received is, um, what role can major US companies such as Amazon and Cisco operating in Japan play in affecting changes in work-life balance? That's a social issue. If you have any thoughts about that. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, having worked for uh, Apple Japan, um, you know, I mean, Japanese, so working, like going to the office is just like a, it's a sacred pillar of Japanese, uh, you know, society. Um, but it's also the biggest impediment to proper and real work-life balance um, initiatives and reform. 
right? Going to the office, staying there for 10 hours, um, and then going out to, you know, drink or sing karaoke. I mean, maybe that's fun once in a while, but like every day, it's just way too much. And uh, um, Japan needs to change, uh, as I was saying, and people love working from home. So uh, again, once in a generation opportunity to make significant change. And to the extent that U.S. companies that have a large presence in Japan are leading that change. I think that puts a lot of pressure, additional pressure on, you know, Japanese corporations to uh, to follow suit. And so, um, uh, you know, as with other social issues, I think you know the U.S. corporations have a huge role to play in this. So, um, and I know that they are, right? They're already um, basically reflecting. Uh, the policies that have been established at headquarters, you know, in the U.S. Um, and so I hope they stick. And I guess that's the, um, that's the question. Okay. So let me go to spend just a couple of minutes. We are running out of time. So um, I want to focus a little bit on the governance issues. Um, it's very important, you know, board composition can affect how the company approaches ESG factors to ensure resiliency and sustainability. Um, you know, if you have a group think tendency, um, you have, um, um, you know, uh, if you don't have a balanced board composition, that can definitely affect you know, what the company uh, will take directionally. According to ISS and Freshfield, board structure and competition proposals were the second most common proposals uh, filed in the 2020 proxy season. Um, and if you could uh, show the next slide, the very last one, that's actually um, Vanguard Investment Stewardship 2020 semi-annual report. Uh, the audience can read it um, while you know, we continue discuss, discussing this is issue. But um, the directors who are both demographically and cognitively different uh, from its incumbent directors are really needed to lessen the risk of groupthink and uh, promote cultural fluency and sensitivity. Uh, these attributes have been shown by numerous research to benefit today's diverse stakeholders, employees, customers, suppliers, and shareholders. So um, just wanted to pose this question real quick. Um, in your experience, um, all of you, how do you think diverse board competition can help uh, future crisis preparedness and uh, sustainable growth? It's kind of a broad question. Um, but um, if anybody could volunteer. Sure, I'll volunteer. Um, okay. You know, I've been serving on corporate boards since uh, 1991 and uh, lived through, um, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank. And there have been a number of changes that have taken place as it reflects um, through the diversity of a particular board and different boards. And, you know, it's very clear that a diverse set of skills on the board, which include ethnicity um, and social and, you know, all the other race and so forth and so on, does make a difference. Now, you know, there was a period of time when boards would say, well, we just can't find anyone qualified. Well, that has been disproven. You can find qualified people of different ethnicity, of race, and, you know, you include gender and skill sets and so forth and so on. And it does make a difference for the board. Um, I think boards have changed and that there is um, a lot of boards, at least the ones I've been involved with have changed, not all. And there is such a thing that should be considered, which is board succession. It used to be, and maybe still is, that some board members think that it's a lifetime uh, entitlement and that they're to be there for the rest of their lives. They go on the board and that's it. Um, but there should be board succession and that succession should follow the board strategy overall because different skill sets will be needed uh, in a changing environment. No doubt in my mind that post pandemic, uh, there will be a number of different skill sets required. So uh, I really strongly advocate uh, a board succession plan that incorporates um, you know, race and gender and ethnicity and, you know, global nationalization, just a whole host of things that each company feels that is necessary for them to conduct their business. 
Uncle, can I uh, go next? Thank you. Uh, wholeheartedly, uh, this is something essential for all boards. Let me give you three uh, examples. First of all, in California, we have a law that actually requires corporate boards of a certain size or to have at least, now, now, at least one woman. Now that cannot be a ceiling. <laughs> that needs to be a start. So it's a start. Uh, I don't know the progress of where we are in California in terms of corporate boards uh, achieving compliance with that. There's also a proposal in the state legislature now, I don't know if it's going to be successful or not, that adds on uh, an, uh, ethnicity uh, to the, to the uh, corporate boards. Uh, in the meantime, we, uh, um, we brought Pacific Gas and Electric, the largest uh, investor-owned utility potentially in the, in the United States. Anyway, we brought PG e out of bankruptcy. It was a massive team effort. It's one of the requirements for coming out of bankruptcy uh, between, between the governor and the governor's office and the CPUC, the CPUC codified that we wanted the governing board to reflect California. It's a California company that at least 50% of the governing board uh, needs to live in California. Uh, and we also uh, had requirements for uh, diversity uh, and, and various backgrounds as well. And then just from personal experience, CPUC, and, and uh, the example I'll give is, I, I was an elected director at our local electric utility not-for-profit board, community-owned Sacramento Municipal Utility District, uh, seven elected directors. And the community of Sacramento, uh, one and a half million people, uh, by the process of elections, said they wanted diversity, diversity in gender, diversity in ethnicity, diversity in backgrounds. And so this is a vertically integrated uh, electric utility district that operates power plants, provides electricity, transmission lines, hydroelectricity. They had a nuclear power plant, so forth and so on. <clears throat> they, they elected a social worker who owned a bookstore. Myself, I actually had some power plant experience. Uh, a banker, uh, a software uh, uh, executive, um, uh, a uh, ICE uh, engineer, uh, and, the, and, and on and on. And in and around that, we <clears throat> were able to, because of the very diversity of, of our viewpoints and our experience, uh, we said we want our customers to have 95% satisfaction in their utility. And we, we set our executive team and the, the staff to do it and to accomplish it, and they did accomplish it. We also said diversity is important, but we need to reflect our community in terms of our workforce. We set that also as a, as a goal, even under the Prop 209, for those in California, you'll know what Prop 209 is, with, even within that rubric. Uh, I'm a strong advocate just from personal experience. You have diverse views uh, on your board, you have a much better product. Thank you. Okay, Marcus, it, we are at the bottom of the hour, so if you can like, wrap up in one minute or so. Uh, sure, um, I'll just say that yeah. uh, you know, Japanese corporations famously, or I should say infamously, have probably the least diverse boards um, amongst uh, modern, uh, you know, uh, uh, modern nations, um, advanced nations, I should say. Um, basically all old Japanese men um, that are lifetime employees of the companies whose boards they sit on, right? And so uh, complete lack of diversity, um, uh, which means management is completely insulated, right? And protected from any outside forces. Um, and this has led to a very predictable result, which is horrible return on equity. Uh, a stock market today that is still 30% below its peak in 1987 um, and then a bunch of just, you know, crazy scandals like what's hap what happened at Nissan, right? Um, and with Nissan, it's, it's an interesting case because you had, they brought in someone from the outside, right, Carlos Ghosn. And he did turn around Nissan, which was an amazing turnaround. Uh, but then they let him control the board completely, right? Like all his allies were on the board and allowed him to do, you know, whatever he wanted to do. And so, you know, it was, it was a great case study until, you know, it turned into a, a horrible one. But in general, as I mentioned, Prime Minister Abe is making a big push for, um, you know, uh, 
you know, better corporate governance um, through legislation, corporate governance code, stewardship code, which I mentioned um, earlier, um, to get more women uh, on the boards, getting more outside directors on the boards, and getting more foreign directors um, on the board. And I think if you look at Japan, right, they're still the third largest economy in the world. Huge economy, very well run uh, companies as far as their core businesses. Uh, but then they're just sitting on all this cash and they need more ideas from the outside and more pressure to deploy that cash in effective and efficient ways, right? Make the right investments, um, M&A, uh, you, know, um, um, you know, pursuing global markets, et cetera. And if they do that, right, it's just purely a leadership issue um, and a board issue, frankly, um, and uh, a lack of diversity issue. And so if they can fix that problem, then I think, you know, Japan has you know, all the potential in the world. Okay, so I feel like we still have a few questions, but unfortunately we are at the bottom of the hour and we can probably go on for another hour of this discussion. <laughs> but um, um, I really um, enjoyed uh, moderating this discussion and we had a great um, discussion and you know, um, interesting um, you know, perspectives from the different you know, sectors. And, um, uh, after this, at the conclusion of this webinar, everybody will receive a feedback survey. So I really encourage everybody to complete the survey because we really value, uh, you know, that the audience opinion about what would be relevant to the audience and membership. So please uh, complete the survey, and, um, and you'll also receive a follow-up survey via email. So if you don't have time today, please uh, take care of it when you receive the email. So um, this concludes today's presentation and um, I'll turn it back to Suzanne. Thank you, Akko, so much. And thank you, Bonnie, Genevieve, and Marcus uh, for a really interesting discussion. And I agree, Akko, there's so much more that we could be discussing and there are a lot of questions and it's a very complicated uh, set of issues, but really important and I learned a lot. Um, to me, one of the most interesting things I took away is I, you know, I do think about how Japan has been ahead about thinking about stakeholders and the U.S. has been thinking about shareholders, but I think Marcus made an interesting point about the, the stakeholders have been very homogenous and not thinking about the diverse set of stakeholders that we should be thinking about. And I think for me, the theme today was really about intentional inclusion of different groups and really thinking in the context of COVID about some of the groups, uh, elderly, uh, women, parents, um, people with disabilities, uh, different groups, uh, certainly minorities and underprivileged that need to be thought of in the context of what's going on in the current crisis. And as we get back to the next normal, um, being more intentional about including them uh, in, in the whole range of issues that are important to companies. So thank you so much for the discussion. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed it and I'm sorry we're out of time. Uh, our next big event will be on September 16th, 17th in Japan, and that is going to be our bilateral boardroom. And I hope that uh, you have registered for it already, and if not, that you will. We're looking forward to um, hosting everybody for that. Thank you again to, for everybody who came here. Thank you to Akko for organizing it. Thank you to the speakers, and thank you to the sponsors who made this possible. Have a good rest of your day or evening. <laughs>